lower of a one. The Riemann hypothesis basically says that if uh, the Riemann zeta function has a zero, let's call it rho, complex number rho, uh, where the real part of rho is in between zero and one, then it must be the case that the real part of rho is actually equal to one half. That's all it says. Now, uh, if you're not familiar with the Riemann zeta function, I talk about it extensively in a lot of previous videos. And uh, we have a, a nice result here that uh, I proved to you in a previous video saying that the Malin transform of the fraction part of one over t has to do with the Riemann zeta function. It's negative zeta over s, okay? Uh, really, it's equal to this integral, which is nice. And this is valid when the real part of s is mature between uh, zero and one. So this is actually of interest to us uh, for the Riemann hypothesis. Also, we have the functional equation, which is valid for every complex number s. Um, and I'm writing it like this, zeta is equal to a function phi times zeta of one minus s, where phi actually, if you wanna know, is equal to this crazy expression here. It's uh, two to the s times uh, pi to the s minus one times sine of pi s over two times uh, gamma of one minus s, if you're curious. Now, finally, we're gonna let uh, rho be such, such a zero. So it's, it's, uh, it's a real part is in between zero and one, and it satisfies uh, zeta of rho being equal to zero. And then to be in the case of this limit, uh, zeta over zeta of one minus s, of course, it's equal to um, to uh, the limit of phi if you just divide in the previous equation we had. And a uh, phi of rho, believe it or not, is never zero or uh, infinity. That can be easily shown. Um, the only time each of those pieces that make up phi is equal to zero is for a value outside of, uh, of the critical strip, meaning it's outside of the real part of the complex input being in between zero and one. So it ends up being uh, true that this limit of zeta of s over zeta of one minus s is actually a valid number. And it's funny because it's an indeterminate form, right? It's zero over zero because uh, rho is a zero. So if you plug it in directly, you get zeta of rho over zeta of one minus rho, which those are actually both zeros of, um, of zeta. But uh, yeah, as it turns out, this limit actually exists, believe it or not. Now, on the other hand, we can actually replace zeta with uh, the Malin transform. Now, really, it'd be negative s over the integral and negative 1 minus s over the other integral. But uh, ignoring those parts ends up being the case that the limit of these two integrals, which is a different number than the previous limit, is still, uh, by similar logic, not 0 or infinity. Uh, in fact, if we replace infinity with x, then these integrals turn into this. And now we can use L'Hopital's rule because this is indeterminate form, zero over zero. These integrals are zero when zeta is zero, as it turns out. Even though, again, there's a multiplication of s and one minus s, this ends up being totally valid. Again, the limit's a different number than the previous limit, but this is still a number that's not zero or infinity. And it is of indeterminate form. As x approaches infinity, you get zero on top, zero on the bottom, so it's indeterminate form. Um, you can apply L'Hopital's rule, take derivative of the top over derivative of the bottom. By the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, Derivative of an integral where the top limit of the integral is x, well, is just the integrand evaluated at x. Now, in this case, the fractional part of one over x actually cancels, and the inside just turns into x to the, well, 2s minus 1. But since s is approaching rho, we get x to the 2 rho minus 1. Now, to make things a little more uh, simple for us, this basically says that this limit is a number it's a possibly complex number, but it's neither zero nor infinity. So to make things a little more specific, we'll say that the limit of the absolute value of this is neither zero or infinity. Now the reason why we kind of need this is because when you take the, um, when you take a complex number to, uh, to a complex power, or really any number to a complex power, I should probably actually say, when you take a real number to a complex power, it's absolute value, it's magnitude basically, or modulus if you like, is that number, that real number base, to the real part of that complex number power. It's really easy to show this by splitting it up and taking advantage of the fact that uh, e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta, so its magnitude is one. So it ends up being the case that a real number to a complex power has an absolute value of that real number to the real part of that power. So the limit of the absolute value of x to the two rho minus one is just x to the um, is just x to the real part of two rho minus one. And well, because it's not zero or infinity, this implies the power must be zero. That makes sense, right? Because if you have 
basically infinity to a power, it's either infinity or zero, unless the power is zero before the base approaches infinity. So it's more specifically, the limit as x goes to infinity of x to a real number, if that limit is not zero nor infinite, it must be the case that that power is actually zero. So then two rho minus one, the real part of two rho minus one anyways is equal to zero, so that the real part of rho, any complex zero of the Riemann zeta function in the critical strip must be equal to one half, thus proving the Riemann hypothesis.